the latest powerful updates to LumaFusion with Terry Morgan of LumaTouch. This is Mac Voices. This edition of Mac Voices is supported by Text Expander by Smile, the makers of world class software. Visit TextExpander.com slash podcast to learn more and download your free demo. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, I've been trying to get Terry Morgan from LumaFusion on the show to talk about the new LumaTouch 3.0 release, and the schedules have just been back and forth, as it seems like everybody's are, but I finally got her. Terry, welcome. It's great to have you. Thanks, Chuck. It's nice to be here. So the big news for LumaFusion is 3.0. We've talked a little bit about some of the things that were coming. You've shown us a little bit before, but now it's out to everyone. And I want to make sure we get them all updated as to what the new capabilities and features are. And so I'll let you take it from there. What do we have that is new and and functioning and working and all in LumaFusion 3? Yeah, we have a lot of new stuff in LumaFusion 3. Um, one of the first things I wanted to show was this, the ability to edit direct from an external drive, a USB-C drive. So if you just plug this in, you can, and I'll show this when we share the screen, you can set that up so that when you are, you know, have it connected, the media just automatically shows in your library. You can edit from that media and not have to copy anything to your iPad or so that you save just a lot, you know, you save all the space actually. And it's a pretty cool new feature that Apple has provided and that we've supported. So just a couple of things to make sure that that looks like a sand disk drive. I have a couple of those myself, yeah. <laughs> um, but it, we're talking about any USB-C drive. Right. Any USB-C drive. Um, there are different versions, of course, but uh, USB 3 or USB 4 should be fine to do the bulk of your editing. Okay. And so I can have all my assets. I can I can keep everything on an external drive if I want and not take up any of the space on my iPad, do all the work, you know, just plug it in, open right. it from there and save it to there and unplug it. And it's all just sitting on the drive, not anywhere else. Right. And one of the cool things about that is you can then take that drive over to Final Cut Pro and plug it in and get your media that way. So it does provide a pretty seamless workflow for people that don't want to transfer media more than once, you know, onto that drive and then move it around with them as they edit. Okay, so you said the magic three sort of two words, final cut. Um, I want to make sure that you know we talk just a little bit about that. We've we've talked about it in the past, but let's talk about it here. And I don't want to get ahead of anything in the release, so stop me if I am doing that. But okay. let's say that I did just exactly what you said. I, I did all my work in Luma Luma Fusion on my iPad. I take that drive, I plug it into my my Mac or Mac Pro or MacBook or whatever. Mm -hmm. Open Final Cut. Now, what is my procedure for working with what I've been using in LumaFusion in Final Cut? Or, uh, yeah, yeah, in Final would, Cut. Right. You would export an uh, XML file to, for Final Cut. And um, then you would just have it connect to that media. You'd say link your media to that drive. So um, it would be a small export file, just the, just the XML data, not the media. And then just connect in that drive and it should automatically link up. If it doesn't, you would just then go, you know, link this media and search for that drive and it would all work. So. Okay. So we basically have the ability to move now uh, easily LumaFusion projects to Final Cut. Yeah, I mean, we've always been able to do that. And from some destinations like Dropbox, where the paths is a true path and it's going to stay the same. You could also do it that way. You know, you could have your, you could import media from Dropbox into LumaFusion, edit with it, then export an XML to Final Cut. And at that point, when you open up that uh, edit in Final Cut, it's going to see that exact path and would automatically link up the media. But that, you know, requires that you have a connection to the internet, for instance. So, 
having the ability to do this from an external drive does two things. First, you don't have to import into your iPad at all. You're just directly editing. And second, you don't need an internet connection to link up to that media again in Final Cut. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, that's I think the first thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, there, there's some definite advantages to this now, especially with the USB-C connections to the, you know, the newer, the newer iPads. Um, it right. feels a little bit more like a workflow that, you know, is maybe not dependent on so many things. And it, I mean, it, I guess it has to be faster, doesn't it, Terry? It is faster, yes. Um, I don't know the exact numbers, but um, in our tests, there were things that were faster. There are also things that were not exactly faster with the newest iPad that we kind of thought would be. But I think, you know, it's what we have to remember is there's a number of functions all working together and speeding up one function doesn't necessarily speed up another. Like, so if you have an M1 chip in your iPad, it doesn't necessarily mean everything is going to be faster. So whatever the slowest bottleneck is, is where the, the speed must lie. So, Got it. yeah. Okay. I, if I took us off track, I apologize, but that just, oh, no. I want to make sure we, we, we tackle that. So let's go back to the 3.0 features. Great. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So let's go ahead and do that and do their play. Okay, great. So first thing I'm gonna show, well, we can go in here and I'll show you how you would connect that drive. So you would go to the files um, directory in the library here, and you'd say add link to folder. This will bring up your files uh, interface here. And instead of on my iPad, you would then see your drive sitting here and you would connect either to a directory in that drive or to the whole drive. I don't have it connected right now because my iPad is actually connected for sharing. So that's why I can't actually show you in this situation, but that's, um, that's how you would do the external drive uh, editing. Now, the one thing that we have added that has been the number one request over the last couple of years has been video stabilization. And we did that with a lock and load, sort of core melt, lock and load stabilizer. And that is the same plugin that's used for the Final Cut version. So it's a very high quality stabilizer. And I'm just going to show you how we can do that here. So I'm going to play a little clip here that um, we just shot out behind our office here. And it's very unstable. There's no tripod. Um, I Hopefully you can see that that's pretty unstable. And then I'm gonna go and take that clip and double tap on it. And over here, you see along the bottom, we have frame and fit, speed, and the third one now is stabilize. And here you see the lock and load stabilization by Cormelt. And really all you have to do is turn it on. And it's gonna do a really quick little tracking of the motion. And then you can play that back. And it with the default settings, you can see here, it's pretty, pretty stable. And I'm gonna show you a few other settings you could do. You can have automatic shutter correction that, that gets rid of shutter roll, say if you did a pan and the you know, sometimes you see part of the image stabilizes here and some, and you get a little wiggle that will help correct for that. Stabilization works best if you're not actually moving side to side, if you're just having a trouble standing in place and holding your camera still, that's the best actual use for it. But we do have the ability to do um, horizontal and vertical um, strength and rotational strength and your zoom strength. In the advanced scaling, you can set it to fixed scale or smart scale. And then you can fill the margin with video or color. Um, that I use personally more as a test to see how if I'm um, how, how much I'm shrinking the image or, or expanding the image in order to do the stabilization. But if we go back here into the timeline, I've made a little edit where if I move this over, we'll be able to see the lock and load versus the um, stabilized version. So I'm going to make this full screen and press play. And you can see the difference here is quite good. 
<laughs> that's that's very good. Yeah. All right. So that brings us to the next thing I wanted to show you was that we can resize the UI now. So if you want to have a large library or um, you have a lot of tracks on your timeline or you want to see the preview, there's a little handle right in the center of the three places where you can grab and drag it any direction you want. If you want to get back to normal, um, you just double tap it. And for each of these uh, layouts down here, you have a setting you know, that you can adjust for each, um, for each one. So if I go back to my corner, it's gonna save that. Um, so that's a really, I, I mean, I think that is the most fun of everything, <laughs> just being able to adjust your UI the way you want. And then I'm gonna show you um, audio EQ and third-party audio unit plugins. So down here you have frame and fit, you have the speed editor, the stabilizer, and this last one is the audio editor. And in the stack here, you can see the graphic equalizer. And here I'm gonna play this audio. And I don't know if you can hear the uh, chainsaw that's going here. I'm gonna raise, uh, it up so you can hear it. Okay. Can you hear the chainsaw? Oh yeah. <laughs> now, if I take those areas down, you'll be able to hear what EQ can do for that. Okay. Yeah, you can still hear the okay, of course, but the rest yeah. is down now to a to a, just a very dull, maybe hiss right. kind of so sound, this which is, is not bad at all. Yeah, it's an 11 band EQ. So you have 11 bands of, of EQ down here along the bottom, and you can either adjust your audio here on the interface, or as you see, you can adjust the, the, the sliders over here. So that's the EQ. I'm going to go to a different clip with some music on it because it's just a better example of how to use these tools. You'll see that we now support third-party audio unit plugins. So a third-party plugin is just a plugin you can download right from the App Store. Just search for AU plugins or audio unit plugins. And we can support anything that's not an instrument but a filter. So obviously you're not going to be building um, music from scratch in Luma Fusion, but you will be able to use things like Breast Free, which is um, a noise reduction or this zero course I'm going to add right here. And on this one, I'm going to just turn the mix down and play this audio, which is just some um, piano. And then I'm gonna adjust these here. And I'm gonna turn the feedback up to here. Um, let's see, go up here and then turn the mix up. Are you hearing that? Yeah, it's, it, at first it wasn't evident until you turned the mix up and then it became right. very evident. So if I were to go and set the delay up higher. Yeah, there you go. Feedback. So you can really play around with these. And one of the cool things about these <laughs> are we have the interface from those plugins right inside LumaFusion. So you can either use their interface or again, you can use our sliders. Another thing that um, we did is, I'm gonna go back to one of our clips here. I'll just use this one and say, let's go to frame and fit. If I wanted to add an exact um, size, say I wanted this exactly at 50% and these sliders are a little bit touchy, I can go to um, a numeric keypad and just put in the number that I want. And the way this works is you have your keypad, you have um, 
a little calculator here. So if you wanted to do times two, times two, times two to increase logarithmically, you could, or you could do something like um, instead of 50, I want minus 50. Um, and that would, okay, that's an invalid entry, but say I wanted minus 100 on this value. So I go here, um, put 100 and press minus, and that would then bring us exactly to minus 100 for the y value. So it just adds a lot more accuracy to those sliders. That, that has always been a little bit of a problem um, because the little nudge buttons are hard. Also, there's giant nudge buttons here. So if you wanna nudge your number, <laughs> it does make it easier. Um, yeah, and so I think that's the main things that went into 3.0. There was loads and loads of other things that are just part of the release, like uh, the new UI for um, the effects editors, new coloring, just some new styling, and a lot of bug fixes along the way too. So that's 3.0. And then another thing about 3.0 is it's a base for the things that are coming later. So we had to do a whole bunch of underground work to support the features that we're doing later, which are multicam editing, video scopes, advanced keyframes with easing and curves, um, and an advanced external display, uh, just loads of stuff coming that needed this base to be written in a way that could support them. This edition of Mac Voices is supported by Text Expander by Smile. Do more with just a few keystrokes with Text Expander. With so many of us working from home now, at least part time, if not full time, we're having to do a lot of things just a little different. That can be good, it can be a challenge, sometimes both at once. That means taking a look at how we're doing things and trying to be more efficient and more consistent. That's why Text Expander from Smile is at the top of my list when I need to try to figure out how to do things just a little bit better. Text Expander can help me do a whole lot with just a few keystrokes. Maybe it's as simple as putting in a mailing address by typing in two or three characters. Maybe it can be as untime consuming as putting in regularly used texts into an email, a Slack message, or a Teams message. Again, just a few keystrokes can drop in paragraphs of information. Even better, though, is that whatever information we're talking about, it's always the same, always correct every single time, so that not only am I saving time, I'm being sure that it's right. That's important for me as an individual, but it can be critical if you are managing a team and want that kind of consistency each and every time. I can't stress enough how much I want you to visit textexpander.com slash podcast right now. Find out more about what Text Expander can do for you, and then download a free demo to see for yourself. TextExpander.com slash podcast and start making your workflows more efficient today. Thanks to Smile for being the longest running sponsor of Mac Voices. Uh, for the people out there that, again, Terry, I'm trying to avoid us both having to answer a bunch of emails. So we're, <laughs> we're watching you work on this iPad and, and show all this. Um, what iPad are you using for this? Well, uh, this is an iPad Pro 11 inch. Um, it's not the latest, the one that I'm using right now. Um, it will okay. work on anything that will run. Uh, I think it's 14.4. Just update your iPad to the latest iOS. And as long as you can do that, you're good to go. Okay. So this is not an M1 iPad that you're running on? No. Okay. All right. Good. Then that makes it even more impressive. Um, I do have one, um, but I left it at home. <laughs> so. Well, that's all right. Because again, th that just means that, you know, if anything, you would expect that there might be even better performance. But what you saw, what 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 you just showed us is more than acceptable performance, um, especially the, the the stabilization. That's just yes. that's just kind of crazy on an iPad. Yeah, it's just getting better and better. So we're really excited. And I don't know, there's all there's news fluttering about about the possibility of ProRes coming. I just read that this morning. I don't know if it's true, but I'm looking forward to that if it is. So, Yeah, I, I read the very same article and thought, really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
which means you darn well better have bought a lot more memory for your iPad. When yes, you got or it. those external drives. <laughs> or the that were the external drives. Yes, I didn't think about it that way. Uh, yeah. uh, we always want more, don't we, Terry? I do. <laughs> Why <Yeah>. not? <laughs> Um, talk just for a second again about the audio units, because that's something that some folks may not be familiar with if they haven't done a lot of audio work in Final Cut, uh, that you can load audio unit uh, plugins in Final Cut. You can now load them in Luma Fusion, and they're they're easy to get, they're easy to install, and they really add a great deal of functionality to uh, to, to the audio part of both programs. Right. That way we get the expertise of different types of audio engineers working to make these plugins great. And then we just can link up to them in LumaFusion and it's, it's great. All you have to do is download the plugin, run it once on your iPad, and then it'll close automatically, I think. And then you open LumaFusion and actually... I shouldn't have stopped sharing, but in Luma Fusion, I will just go ahead and try to share again. And then I can show you how that works. Dex. Okay. Um, for those plugins, let's go to the audio. Down here um, in this area, you see this little button that allows you to add and subtract and reorder your plugins um, as you like. So some people have hundreds and hundreds of these plugins on their device, and this allows them to kind of limit what goes into LumaFusion. And since we don't de develop those plugins, there is an opportunity for them to not be good ones. So this would allow you to say, okay, this one um, crashes everything, I'm not going to use that anymore. And you could actually take it out of LumaFusion so that it's not causing problems. And because we're not the developers of those, we don't have any control over whether things work or not. But we did put this interface in so you can control that. And I mean, that's true. It doesn't matter whether it's LumaFusion or, or another uh, NLE, you know, the the, the plugin is the plugin. And, and so if it's not optimized, if it's not updated, yeah, you might have trouble with it. But um, I, I, I have found that Final Cut is a surprisingly great audio editor, that there's so much stuff you can do with it. And now you've just brought a lot of that over to LumaFusion by yeah. you know supporting the plugins that now I can probably probably do just about anything I want in LumaFusion and not have to fire up Final Cut if I don't want to. Right. I mean, that's my preference just from the point of view that LumaFusion is a, a simpler experience, It's, but it's just as powerful. Not, I mean, there's things you can't do, obviously, on an iPad that you can do on a desktop, but there's also things you can do on an iPad that you can't do on a desktop. And one of those is to be able to work really quickly and really creatively on, um, on cutting and, and getting your timeline just right. And the timeline in LumaFusion is actually a really great combination of a magnetic timeline and a track-based timeline like Premiere. So no matter which thing you're used to, you can lean on that type of editing. Um, but I've grown to get accustomed to this combination that really gives me a lot of control over my timeline, but also the nice features of being able to link things to um, other parts of the timeline so that they move along as I edit. So it's, to me, it's the gold standard for a timeline model. So I prefer to stay on my iPad whenever I can. We've talked about some of this before, but it, the iPad in a lot of areas is moving to a to a no compromises device, um, and and LumaFusion has been kind of at the forefront of a lot of that. Uh, you know, yes, you've been you've had to play catch up a little bit, obviously, because the NLEs were well established over on the on the desktops. But I, I mean, it's it's kind of amazing what you've done here, and I know just from what you said earlier, there's there's even more coming. So, you know, 
it, yeah. it's just it's a phenomenal program to to use with your iPad. It's phenomenal to develop for the iPad, to be honest. What it does, because it doesn't rely on a lot of menus and tool tips and all sorts of stuff like that, it forces the designer and the developer to think really hard about where items should be, how they should be discoverable, how to make them easy to use without having a really small target. And it really makes you think differently about designing for your customer. So there's, I think there's a lot more usability testing going on and a lot more focus groups and a lot more getting input from the community about what is the right thing for this device. Because we can't simply just make a feature and not figure out what to do with it. So stick it in a menu somewhere. We just can't do that. So it forces us to really sit down and think, okay, how can we do this? And I think multicam is going to be a great example of that. The way that we're doing multicam, it just makes it really fun. Uh, you, you, you sync your things into a clip and then open that clip and you're just tapping away to cut to different angles. And it does, it is. It does feel different than when you're working multicam on a bigger system or a desktop system because the first thing you have to do on a desktop system is learn how to assign your cameras to certain clips and do all that kind of stuff. Where is in iPad, we had to make that automatic. So you just drop your clips into the drop zones and they're already assigned and they're already ready to go. So that's the kind of thing that iPad forces you to do, which ultimately results in a better product. That's really interesting. And I hadn't thought about it. I mean, some of the things you said are obvious as a user, but not obvious thinking about developing for it. Um, and, you know, I guess it also helps that the fact that you've built this from the ground up, you know, learning lessons from the desktop, but recognizing that the iPad has, not limitations, but different characteristics. Um, your, your comment about you know making things discoverable is is really interesting because that's of course one of the things that you've you've only got. I mean, even with the largest iPad, you still have limited screen real estate, and so you need to make make things either discoverable or put the ones that you're most likely to use in front of me, and then make the others easier to get easy to get to. Right. And I think the lack of the context menu or the right click menu, um, I mean, you do have the long press knit menu now, but it's not used a lot. And the lack of just having these giant menus, it forces us to develop different, but it also makes it much less intimidating to use. So you can click, you can tap on any button, for instance, and find out what it does right away without fear of doing something wrong because the button wouldn't be there if it was going to do something disastrous. And on a on a desktop system, if you're trying to figure out how to do something, you're going to go to the one of the menus and then you'll get a, a panel with several tabs and lot, lots of things you can do on there. And half of them you probably won't know what they mean. And so it's really intimidating to think about whether or not you want to change one of those settings without knowing what you're doing. And so the experience on the iPad is very freeing and kind of lighthearted and, and fun. And that's what you need to be creative. You need to not worry about the system. So I've been editing for 30 years and I can say that once you know a system, that's when you can become creative. But if you're worried about how the system works and am I going to break something and is something going to not work, then it, that's your main goal is to not break it. And you can't be creative. But so the iPad just really frees you up, um, takes that fear away and gives you a really great canvas to start building on. How do you feel about editing on the iPad using the Apple Pencil? Is it a better experience? Is it a different experience? I mean, how have you as a developer addressed that, that tool? Yeah. Well, I know that there's people on our team that always use a pencil. They just always do. And I don't know if it's what size your finger is or whatever, but I personally never use, I have one, but I don't use it. I feel like 
You know, it's like when you very first started texting and you had to kind of get your aim right with your finger. And once you figure that out, you're good to go. And for me, there's a certain kind of beauty and simplicity to reaching out and touching something that I want to do. It takes out the interface. And that was one of the really wonderful things about iPad is it's just you and a sheet of glass and you're interacting as closely as possible with your media. You don't have a mouse, you don't have a keyboard, you don't have to be accurate. And so I really just love working just with my finger. I always edit it just with my finger. Yeah. Just when you, again, when we're talking about making things discoverable and easy to hit with your finger, um, I, I know I'm the same way. I know people that swear by, the i the the iPad with an Apple pencil. I'm not an Apple pencil. Per- I've even tried to become an Apple pencil person, and it apparently is just not. It's because I guess I don't have any real drawing skills, or my brain doesn't connect to my hand that way. But I, I, I find it. Yeah, it's fine. You know, and it's it's okay for scribbling. But I can't say that I really find it that much of an enhancement for me. So I was agreed. And, yeah, and it's it's really interesting that you find just using your finger or working with what you've created here easier, but some of your team members don't. So yeah. Andrew, for instance, our support manager, he just has it always, always uses it. So. Yeah. I guess there's no right answer to the question. He's also an artist though. So maybe it does have something to do with just feeling comfortable with that pencil yeah. or brush in your hand. And we're just a couple of non-artists who just yes, that's, that's the bottom line. Finger is fine. That's all. <laughs> I'll just do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was born without. I know how to use that. The pencil forget. That's right. We can draw <laughs> stick figures with our finger. <laughs> exactly, Terry. With everything we've talked about, with all the cool features, and we're telling people to go and play with this. I want them to go and play with it, um, but they don't have to go and play with it to learn it. There is a way for them to actually get some training on LumaFusion, and that training is? Yes, we're doing uh, an academy, so it's a LumaTouch Academy, and the trainers are Glenn Mulcahy and Carolyn Scott. You know, they're both super experienced in mobile journalism and mobile content creation, and those classes will start on the 16th and be going onwards from there, 16th of August. And they are small two-hour classes. Um, They're $50 for the early bird price. And they teach everything from basic LumaFusion and advanced LumaFusion to things like shooting for editing and building your social media brand. And you can sign up for those classes or read more about them at luma-touch.com forward slash academy. And so that's that's something we're really excited about. We're really excited to be working with Glenn and Carolyn. We had done some longer, um, several day classes, like a certified training with them, and they worked out really well. But we the feedback was we wanted people wanted shorter uh, classes just because their schedules wouldn't allow a big chunk of time. So we're doing these little short classes, and they should be really fun. And I will be attending some of them myself just to pitch in and be there to answer questions or just to enjoy the class myself. So just to be clear, because this probably will get out uh, just about the time those are starting. This is not something that you have to sign up for the first one and then the second and the third and the fourth. You can dip your toes in and out depending on what the topic is and how how it fits your needs. Absolutely. Yeah, you can pick any any one of them. And then we have some classes that are more appropriate for European time zones and some that are more appropriate for um, the American time zones. So you'd be able to pick from those and yeah, it'd be great. That's even better because that's, that's always the only trouble with live training or live, live anything is, you know, you have a global audience for your software, but you know, not everybody is in your time zone. So good job. Good job. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So 3.0 is out now and it's available. Um, Terry, how are you handling upgrades or or how is that working if I've been a previous LumaFusion user? Well, 3.0 is free. And you just if you have LumaFusion, you have 3.0. You just have to make sure you update your iOS um, because it doesn't work with earlier versions. Um, 
before 14 point something. But if you update iOS, then you just can get the new version of LumaFusion. Now that we are going to have, like I said, we put a lot of effort into the base of this and we wanted to give away these features for free and these upgrades for free. And then later on, the things like multicam video scopes and these more, these features that not everybody's going to use, but are really important to some people, those will be paid um, in-app purchases. Okay. Again, that's something else I know that we we talk a lot about here on Mac Voices is the the different pricing models and everything because you as developers need to get paid and we want Andrew with his pencil there to support us <laughs> and you know so that it has to work that way but you've built just such an amazing tool here for an amazing price and and that price of course is it's in the US is twenty nine ninety nine I believe. And um, in other countries, you know, Apple handles the translation of the, you know, the cost. But um, yeah, it's it's a one-time purchase. So we don't do subscription, except there's one subscription in our app, and it is Storyblocks. Storyblocks is a, a video library. It has video, music, sound effects, and backgrounds. And we pay a subscription to Storyblocks to be able to license that to our users at a very discounted rate. So that's why we have to have that as a subscription. It just, other, otherwise we couldn't do it. But the rest of it is, will either be an in-app purchase or just included with the main app. Right. And just to be absolutely clear, you don't have to subscribe to Storyblocks. You don't have to. You can, there are free, uh, a number of free clips and music and sound effects in Storyblocks. In, in LumaFusion. Um, so you could use those or you could do things like, um, I know YouTube has a free audio library that you can download things, or at least they used to, um, and then import those into LumaFusion. So there's no requirement that you get story blocks. It's just super fun if you do. <laughs> it's just a really nice way of, find, say you went on vacation and forgot to get a perfect picture of the Taj Mahal, you type in Taj Mahal and there's there's the picture you wanted right there. So, and, and then for music, of course, that's amazing because it's all royalty free. And even if YouTube does say, oh, wait a minute, this has a copyright on it. It is not a real copyright. It's just a, a flag. And then um, right in the app, we have a way of reporting that and within within a day that that will be cleared off of, of your account. So yeah, that's all great. Yeah. yeah. We're about to go down a rabbit hole of all the details of permissions and everything on what you can use where, and that's, we'll, we'll save that yeah. for another time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So $30 basically for LumaFusion. Um, if you have LumaFusion, you've already got this version of it. And if not, then you need to go and get it because this, this is just fun to play with. If you don't do anything else but play with it, it's just, it's it's better than any 20 video games you're going to find. So trust me, go get LumaFusion. Um, yes. Terry, the website where folks can learn more uh, as if we haven't told them enough already and, uh, and you know, then link over to the app store. Yeah, it's um, Luma, sorry, <laughs> lumatouch.com. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here as always. We, we love having you back every time because you always show, show such, such amazing stuff. And this is right in there pitching. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you having us on here regularly. And um, we're looking forward to seeing you very soon when we have our director's pack and craft pack coming out. Just let me know. Okay. <laughs> In fact, you better let me know now so we can start the scheduling process because you and I just I know that was hard natural. this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Folks, I'm well, Chuck Joyner. Oh, thank you, Terry. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. I, I really mean it. Uh, if you're playing video games, stop and go play with LumaFusion. You'll get more out of it. You'll be able to do more. You will be amazed at how much you can do with LumaFusion in such a very short learning curve. It's it's something I, 
I've spent a lot of time playing with and I continue to, to find new things and new ways to use my iPad. Until the next time, and as always, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Facebook group or like our Facebook page and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard and on the web. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us through either our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash macvoices or by making a one-time donation via the PayPal link on our front page and in the show notes of each episode. You will join these fine people who help bring you Mac Voices. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.